everyone. Um, chapter two of the day we went to meet the Queen. Um, so, chapter two, the revenge that stunk. Brendan the bully hates Armit and me and Michael and Tom and Josie. In fact, I think he might hate everyone. But he hates us the most because a few weeks ago he got caught calling Armit so many horrible names that he nearly got expelled. It wasn't our fault that happened, but bullies don't care if things are your fault or not. They just need someone to blame. So Brendan the bully blamed all of us, but he blamed Armit the most. That's why I knew I had to keep a close eye on him and make sure he didn't do anything to ruin the assembly or our trip to see the Queen. When we got into school, we made our way to the classroom. Armit wasn't there, but as we were sitting down at our tables, he ran in and sat next to Miss Hemsey, his special teacher, at the back of the class. I gave him a quick wave and he gave me one back. After that, everything began to feel strange and normal all at the same time. Mrs Khan started to call the register, just like she always did, but instead of saying, here Miss, in bored voices, everyone answered their names in a jumpier way than usual as if they had ants in their pants that were making them shuffle in their seats and look back at the five of us. I noticed Brendan the bully and his two best friends, Chris and Liam, looking back too. But instead of scrunching up their faces at us like they usually did, they were laughing and whispering. Armit didn't seem to notice that everyone was looking at all of us, but Josie's face was now so red and blotchy that it looked like a pizza and Michael was sweating so much that even his glasses were steaming up. He also looked as if he was having a competition with Tom to see who could touch his hair the most. Tom kept patting his bright blonde spikes every few seconds as if to check they were still there, and Michael kept poking at his bubbly afro as if wanting to make sure it wasn't melting. And I could feel my ears burning and my heart thumping inside them as I waited for Mrs Khan to finish the register. After what seemed like three years, she finally did and told me and Armit and Tom and Josie and Michael that we could leave early and that Miss Hemsey could go with us too. We grabbed our notes and our royal invitations and Armit grabbed his bright red rucksack. It still smelled of old baked beans, even though his foster mum had washed the bag with extra strong washing up liquid at least nine times. That meant every time Armit picked up his bag, he had to smell that horrible smell and was forced to remember the time when Brendan the bully had poured a huge can of baked beans inside it just to be mean to someone who was a refugee. I guess there are some bad smells and memories that not even washing up liquid can get rid of. How are you all feeling? asked Miss Hemsey as we hurried down the corridor towards the main hall. Okay, said Tom, his voice sounding extra squeaky. We all nodded in agreement but I knew we weren't really okay at all. Only Armit looked as if he was actually happy and not pretend happy. He was holding his invitation out in front of him carefully, as if it was made of glass and smiling. I wondered if back in his school in Syria, he was used to doing lots of assemblies. Maybe before the war had started and he'd had to run away, he had stood on a stage and spoken to his whole school lots of times. I told my brain to remember to ask him later, or to ask Miss Hemsey to ask him for me. Ah, there you are, kids. Good morning, good morning, cried out Mrs Sanders as she walked through the large double doors leading to the main hall. There were long lines of people with cameras standing in front of all the walls. Mrs Sanders came over to us and made us walk quickly past the reporters and cameras that were now clicking and flashing and whispering at us. They made Michael so nervous that he tripped up the stairs and Josie nearly dropped her invitation but they each pretended as if they hadn't done either of those things. We hurried to the side of the stage and stood behind the large red velvet curtains that were hanging there. It felt good to get away from all the shining eyes and lenses, even though I knew they were there waiting for us. Whoa, whispered Tom as he peeked out from behind the curtains. I've never seen so many cameras, not even when we were first famous. They are here because the Queen... She is our friend now, yes? asked Armit, nudging me with his elbow and grinning. I smiled back at him, then peeked out through the curtain too. 
I wanted to see if there were any reporters that looked like Tintin, because if there were, then maybe they would be nicer to us than the reporters who had made up stories about us when we became famous the first time round. But there wasn't a single reporter that looked like Tintin, not even a little bit. Most of them were wearing smart suits and shiny shoes and looked like people who worked in banks and offices. I'm pretty sure those kinds of reporters aren't very much fun. If I do ever become a reporter, when I grow up, I want to be like Tintin and wear a raincoat and scruffy clothes and go on adventures with a pet dog named Snowy. Only in my case, the pet will need to be a hamster or a parrot or a boa constrictor or something else that I'm not allergic to but which can still be clever and save my life when I need it to. And even though I can't have a dog, I still want to be as brave and as friendly to everyone as Tintin is. And I definitely don't want to be like one of the horrible reporters that pick on everyone. Ever since Armit made us famous, I've learned that not all reporters care about being friendly or even about telling the truth. I know because they've called Armit things that I don't really understand, but what I can tell right away aren't very nice. Words like fraudulent and illegal immigrant, which are grown-up ways of saying that they don't like him. Some of them even said mean lies about me and Tom too. But mum says that we should feel very sorry for bad reporters because lying makes their words empty and one day no one will believe anything they say. I had never thought of words as things that could be full or empty before. But mum's a librarian who's read at least 59,000 books, so she knows about everything. After a few minutes, I snuck another look and saw the hall doors opening and classes walking in to fill up the rows of chairs that were waiting for them, like train seats. Mrs Sanders came running up the steps of the stage. No need to be nervous, she said, peering at us, over at us at the top of her glasses. You'll all be brilliant. Just remember to speak as loudly and as clearly as you can and most important of all, to have fun. I could hear Michael gulping loudly, as if fun wasn't something he ever thought he was going to have again. And Tom tapping his invitation against his knees. I wonder why teachers and parents always tell you to have fun when you're about to do the scariest and least fun thing you could ever have to do. Let's practice one more time, said Josie, her face now so red and so blotchy that she looked like a can of a Mindstone soup. I nodded and blinking my eyes so that they could focus and get out our list of questions, I looked down at them and hoped they would remember everything I have to say. The list looked like this. The 10 most important questions to ask the Queen of England, which we cut down from 52 almost as important questions. Number one, have you ever met anyone who's more famous than you? That's Tom's question. Number two, what's your favourite football team? Josie's question. Number three, how heavy is your crown and does it give you a headache when you're wearing it? That's Michael's question. Number four, what's your favourite fruit? Armit's question. Number five, if you weren't the queen, what would you have wanted to be? Would you have liked to be an astronaut? Maybe, because all of the star medals you wear. That's my question. Number six, who's the Lord Chamberlain that wrote our invitations? And can you do his job even if you have bad handwriting? That's Tom's question. Number seven, how does it feel using money and stamps and things with your face on it? And do you like your picture or do you wish you could change it? Josie's question. Number eight, have you ever been to Disneyland and did you get to go on all the rides for free because you're the queen? That's Michael's question. Number nine, this is Armit's question now. How many handbags do you have and which one would you take with you if you had to go and run away from a war. And finally, number 10, this is everyone's question. Will you help more children like Armit stay safe and find their families until all the wars end? Okay, you lot, ready? Asked Mrs Sanders. And before any of us could shake our heads with a yes or a no, she stepped out onto the stage and clapping her hands shouted, quiet everyone. Instantly, the hall fell silent. Good morning, school, everyone shouted back. Good morning, Mrs Sanders. Mrs Sanders nodded proudly and clasping her hands together, looked out at everyone. Tomorrow, as you all know, 
five of your fellow students will be going off to Buckingham Palace to meet the Queen and join her for what I imagine will be a rather wonderful tea. Someone cried out, woohoo, which made everyone else giggle and laugh. Yes, woohoo indeed, said Mrs Sanders, smiling. Now, Armit and his friends have been invited to meet the Queen because they did something extraordinarily brave and kind to help each other. And since we are a school of sanctuary which values acts of kindness and courage, I'm sure you are all as proud of your fellow classmates as I am. So instead of me boring you with the details, I'm going to ask them to come out and tell you all about it and show you the messages they have received from the Queen. Everyone began to clap and cheer and whoop and Mrs Sanders waved us out onto the stage. My ears felt like they were full of cotton wool and my head was fizzing like a big ball of electricity as I followed Armit out and stood next to him. I looked out, but instead of seeing faces I knew, I saw an ocean of eyeballs blinking back at me. Armit, you're first, off you go, said Mrs Sanders. She gave him a little pat and walked off to the side of the stage. I watched as Armit looked over his shoulder at Mrs Hemsey, who was giving him a double thumbs up. He took a step forward, flicking his hair out of the way. He looked out at the school with his grey, brown, lion eyes and opened his mouth. Tomorrow I will go and I will see the Queen of England because she invited me to her house. He took another step forward and held up his invitation, showing everyone the message the Queen had sent him. His invitation was different from the rest of ours because after his name, the Queen had written out the bravest refugee boy I know after it. In Syria, when we go to friend's house, we bring... Armit stopped and tried to remember the word he needed. Everyone waited and I could feel my mouth wanted to yell out the word for him. Gifts, shouted Armit, suddenly remembering. We bring gifts of sweets and chocolates so we can share with tea. So when I meet Queen, I will give her sweets with lemons so she can share and I will show her this. Armit lifted up his rucksack and held it up. I could see some people were frowning and whispering and looking very confused, but they fell silent when Armit opened his mouth again. This bag come with me from Syria, and it was gift from my dad, so I think Queen will like it, and I will let her hold it so she can see everything inside it, and I will tell her not to smell it. Ew! screeched a girl from the back of the hall. Ugh! cried a boy a second later. What's that smell? yelled someone else from the middle of the hall. The whole hall turned to look in a different direction as people began to jump up from their seats with their hands over their mouths, squealing. Stink bomb! came the answer from someone near the back. And instantly, everyone who hadn't already stood up jumped up from their seats. In less than a second, the whole hall had changed from a sea of eyes to a blurry rush of bodies running in different directions as teachers and children tried to get away from the disgusting smell. But there wasn't just one disgusting smell, there were lots. Every few seconds, a new wave of terrible smells seemed to be coming from different part of the hall. Mrs Sanders had to run back onto the stage and was trying to hold her nose and tell people to calm down at the same time. I'm going to die, came a cry. We've got to get out of here, shouted a boy with his jumper over his head. Miss, miss, look, screamed a girl, pointing to the boy next to her, who was about to heave and howl as if there was a river about to burst. He's going to be sick. I knew me and Josie and Tom and Michael and Armit should have moved and run too, but we couldn't. It was as if our, our feet were super glued to the floor and our eyes couldn't stop staring. It was strange watching everything from high up on the stage. Even though we could smell the horrible smells, it felt as if we weren't a part of the school anymore and all we could do was stand and watch as everyone screamed and ran in different directions and crashed into each other like bumper cars. Order! shouted Mrs Sanders, clapping her hands together and trying not to cough. From around the hall, we could see teachers pushing past shocked reporters and frantically opening doors and windows. Teachers, take your classes back in an orderly fashion to your classrooms. Quickly, please. Another stink bomb puffed into the air, making everyone squeal again. Although now some of the squeals sounded more excited and happy than shocked and disgusted. 
As the class is left line by line, Mrs Sanders hurried over to us. I'm sorry, kids. You'll have to get back to class. Assembly is over, I'm afraid. Oh, said Tom, sounding disappointed. That sucks. We are not telling about this any more, Armit asked, looking at me. His line eyes were getting bigger and bigger, and I knew he was feeling upset. I shook my head, feeling sorry for him. No, I'm afraid not, Armit. Now off you go, said Mrs Sanders, patting him on the arm gently. Miss Hemsey came to lead us through the invisible clouds of smells. By now, most of the reporters were running out too. Some of them were even pushing past the classes in front of them to get out of the hall quicker. As we left the stage and hurried out behind Miss Hemsey, I felt a tickle at the back of my neck. Sometimes you can tell right away when someone is staring at you. It's like an invisible hand giving the back of your head a push. Sometimes the push can be a friendly one, but most of the time the push is a surprising and scary one, especially when the stare continues a bad feeling like the one I was getting right then. So I looked over my shoulder. As I did, my eyes bumped straight into the bright blue shining eyes of Brendan the bully. And I knew right away by the big smirky shape of his lips that he had done it. He had let off all the stink bombs somehow and he had got his revenge on Armit by spoiling our special royal assembly. I didn't know how he had done it. He hadn't moved from his chair in the middle of our class row and Chris and Liam had stayed next to him too. So he must have used something special to make the whole school stink. Maybe he had a super special remote control gadget or had people to help him on the other side of the hall. However he had done it, I had to find out what else he had planned and to stop him from doing it before he ruined our tea with the Queen. So that's the end of chapter two. Join me again for chapter three of the day we met the Queen. <laughs>